Jay Baba, and welcome everyone to our commemoration of Miss Krask, Baba's dancer, Margaret Krask. Very happy to be here today and to let our hearts dance a bit with a beloved dancer. I'm going to turn it over to Karen Talbot, who's going to give us a nice idea about Margaret's life. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, everyone. Today is actually the day that Margaret was born in 1892 in Mutford, Suffolk, England. She has two sisters, Dorothy and Olive. Her Persian name that Baba gave her was Zulika, which means jewel. She passed on February 18th, 1990 at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Her ashes are interred at Maribod next to Elizabeth Patterson's. Margaret, who is Baba's dancer, began dancing at age 14. She was very athletic and um, was a dance prodigy from the very beginning. In 1918, she began lessons with Enrico Cicchetti, and in 1920, <clears throat> Diagolib, and I'm mispronouncing the name, hired her. Her career came to an end when she sadly damaged her Achilles tendon. She became Cicchetti's assistant and took over teaching at his studio. Between 1929 and 1931, Margaret lost everyone she valued, her mother, father, fiance, Digalev, Anna Pavlova all died. Margaret needed a place to recover and rest. On her way to the south of England, she began talking with a woman. The woman told her about Meredith Starr's retreat in Devonshire and suggested Margaret visit. At the end of this conversation, the woman mentioned that there were four hours of meditation daily. So clearly that wasn't the beginning impetus that was kind of snuck in at the end. Margaret went to the retreat. When she arrived, she saw a photo of Meher Baba and asked who he was. Five months later, Meher Baba came to London with an entourage. It was Margaret who opened the door for Meher Baba when he first arrived at the London home of Herbert and Kitty Davies' parents to begin his mission in the West. Margaret said he was standing at the foot of the steps leading to the front door, dressed in a thin white gown, a short furry coat, and a pink turban, and he was looking at the house very quietly. He passed in through the door and gave me a smile in passing. A little later, I went in to see him. I was very nervous and did not know how to address him. But as soon as I entered the room, I was completely won over by the love which seemed to permeate his whole personality. He spelt out on the alphabet board. It was your love that brought me to the West. She saw him at that moment as a vision of gentleness, grace, and love that touched the heart immeasurably. Before that first day was out, she said, I only knew that from that moment, whatever rough treatment he may have afterwards handed out, there was never a moment's doubt as to his being the embodiment of love and life. Baba asked her to come to East Chalicombe, and she did on September 19th, 1931, for four days, she wrote. Of the four days which I spent in Devonshire with him in the group, it is difficult to write. The whole time was invested with a dreamlike quality of pure love, timelessness, and great beauty. Baba asked her to dance at one point. At that time, she was wearing a tight skirt, country boots, and there was no flat surface. Kenneth Ross joined in with his bagpipes. She danced other times, but that was the first. 
During this visit, she traveled to Paris and was with Baba at the Eiffel Tower. Because she spoke French very well, he asked her to accompany him on the train to Marseille, where they would embark on a ship back to India. She had the compartment next to Baba's. Baba told her, if he knocked three times, that meant I love you. She was to knock back three times. This transpired throughout the night. On one occasion, Chanji said of Margaret, she is a link type. Baba must have Margaret. In mid-April 1932, Margaret um, went again to East Chalicone to be with Baba. Baba was in a playful mood at one point. He made signs and Chanji translated that Baba said that I should give him a dancing lesson. This was fun of the highest order. Chanchi took Baba's hand and brought him to class. I then took his hand and showed him simply a one, two, three hop step, no obstacles. He took it at once and then hand in hand, we flew around the garden path. And I mean, really flew. He could move as no one else has ever moved with joy, freedom, rhythm. And I knew without intellectualizing that dance was, is, and always will be a part of God. The next time she danced for Baba, she had no prep, heavy clothing, an old gramophone with broken records. And Baba asked her to dance around the tables for one half hour. Baba returned to India in August 1932. In February 1933, Margaret was one of the first Westerners to accept Baba's invitation to come to India for several years, but they were sent back home after three weeks. Baba invited them to Nasik again in December 1936. This time they stayed until July 1937. Baba returned to the West with them, and this was the trip that Mera and Mani actually went on as well. In 1939, Margaret received an order from Meher Baba to come to India immediately. Prior to this, she had been asked when she was in London to look after Rustam and Franey's son, Falu. So Baba asked her to bring Falu back to India. And this was about the time of the war. So it was a very difficult situation. She eventually left England. It was very difficult for her to get visas. The only reason she was able to get the visa was because she was bringing an Indian citizen. I think Delia as well tried to come at that time and was denied. She eventually left England and brought Falu and she only had two 10 pound notes in her shoes. She was forced to leave her money in England. When they arrived in Colombo, Sri Lanka, the money left in her shoe paid for their passage to Bangalore, where they met Meher Baba. And at that point, she was penniless. Margaret was very fortunate to spend the next seven years in Meher Baba's ashram. She had many duties. At that time, she was given the job of reading newspapers to Baba, reading other books, including Agatha Christie, P.G. Wodehouse, Rex Stout, Tolkien, and others. She was also given the task to teach Mera and Mani to swim. And this is interesting. She said Mera learned to swim due to her one-pointed devotion to whatever Meher Baba asked of her. She was also in charge of caring for many of the animals in the ashram. After all this time spent in India, in 1946, Meher Baba asked her to return to London and then go to the U.S. On May 1st, 1946, she traveled with Meher Baba and Kakabaria to New Delhi. Then from there, she took the train to Ahmednagar. 
she was Naraman and Arnavas' first guest at Ashiana. She stayed with them for 10 days while waiting for a birth to the UK. Baba told Margaret in India prior to her traveling to the USA, she would lay cables for him. Laughing, Baba opened his hands and then spelled out on his alphabet board, you must go, I have made you my link in America. Margaret Crasp was invited by Anthony Tudor and Lucia, Lucia Chase to give lessons to their dance company, American Ballet Theater. She arrived in New York by chartered airplane after briefly going to Canada, where she obtained the appropriate visa in 1946. At that time, she was 54 years old. By New Year's Day, 1947, she was teaching in San Francisco. In 1950, American Ballet Theater and the Metropolitan Opera joined together to form the Metropolitan Opera Ballet School. Margaret became the director and remained there until the school closed in 1968. She then joined the Manhattan Festival Ballet as ballet mistress <clears throat> until 1983. When it closed, she moved to <clears throat> Ballet School New York, where she taught for the next three years until her retirement in 1986 at the age of 94. During those preceding years, she also taught at theater and at the theater and school at Jacobs Pillow, Massachusetts, and Juilliard School of Music and Dance. She authored two books on ballet. The books were two standard references on the Cicchetti technique. One was titled The Theory and Practice of Allegro in Classical Ballet. And she wrote that with a gentleman, C.W. Beaumont in 1950. And then she wrote The Theory and Practice of Advanced Allegro in Classical Ballet. And that one she wrote with Dara de Moroda. Dance Magazine in her obituary said that she greatly influenced how ballet technique is to be taught. In 1952, when Baba and the Mandali came to visit the Mayher Spiritual Center in Myrtle Beach, um, some of her dancers came as well. Tex Hightower and others came to the Mayer Center in 52, despite horrific weather conditions. The um, pilot wasn't sure that they would make it and they persevered and did. Rudolf Bing came to know of Mayer Baba since they had to let him know where they were and why they would be so late. During 1950, in 1952, during Meher Baba's visit to the U.S. and when they um, drove to Prague, Oklahoma, and had the accident, Baba had the accident in Prague, Delia de Leon phoned Margaret about the car crash. Baba wanted Margaret to come to Prague. The next day, Margaret flew there. Baba asked her to exercise the muscles on the right side of his body without moving the bone structure. Three times a day, she worked on Baba's muscles on his right side and did what she could for Mara and Elizabeth. In 1956, when Baba returned, Margaret sat at the main table with Baba and others at Longchamp's restaurant. She accompanied Tex Hightower, Peter Saul, Bunty Kelly, and Marie Adair at the Holiday Inn in San Francisco prior to Baba's visit to Australia. When Baba returned in 1958 to the Mayer Center, Margaret told Tex Hightower, Peter Saul, and Don Mahler to carry Baba's chair at the center when he visited. Helen Bunty Kelly, who was Scottish, taught the dancers the Highland Fling, which was performed for Baba during his visit there. When Margaret retired, 
She moved to Myrtle Beach and lived at Happy House on the Mayher Center. She shared stories of her life with Mayher Baba with so many of us. She was a member of the board of directors of the Mayher Spiritual Center for many years. She wrote two books. Um, one was The Dance of Love in 1980, her memoir, and Still Dancing with Love, she wrote in 1990. She shared stories of her life with Meher Baba in both books. When they first met, Meher Baba said to Margaret, I had not expected to find you so fast. Of her, Meher Baba said, you're a jewel of the disciple, Jay Baba. Jay, Baba, Karen, so beautiful. Thank you so much. It's I just wonderful that. to hear all the stories and fill in the, the blanks of her life. Thank you. I have a, a, a little video that I'll show of Margaret. Mute myself. Dancer dancing to his word, footsteps winging. Abandoned flight of blazing light Whirling in divine romance Dancer, dancer, dance is dance To the drum of God, men's heart in which all music has its start from creation's soundless singer to every gesture, every glance, dance, dancer, dance. Of his smile, you may want to rest a while, but keep on dancing, dancer, please not to rock. Dance can never see.
time I saw Margaret Krask was um, in the in the reading room you know at the library before the reading room was there and she I think it was in 96 and she gave a talk at the center and um, I remember everybody was so excited I didn't know who it was but they were all so happy to get a chance to hear Margaret Krask talk about Mayor Baba and so we rushed in and I found a seat somewhere and the room was packed and crowded and and I think at noon or two o'clock when she was supposed to start speaking she had them lock the door <laughs> and um and then she spoke and it was just it was just it just took you completely away so Anyway, um, that was the first time I met Margaret Krask, or saw Margaret Krask. I don't know that I met her. If I went up and spoke, I might have. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to share. If not, I have a small uh, video that I could show. Karen, is your hand up here? No. You see Gabriella? Gabriella, che papa. Hey, Baba. Um, I just, I actually can't stay too long today, but I wanted to at least say something before I'd have to go. And thank you for that video. Uh, so touching. And um, I never really got to meet Margaret, or maybe if I did, it was very brief. I 
don't remember any individual, but, but that video, her, I just wanted to comment. I'm sure everyone felt it along with me, but what a, what a woman, you know, just, just her face, the way she, her destiny is written on her face and what a divine destiny and what a, an incredible, you know, satisfaction at the end of one's life to know that you've done exactly your perfect destiny. It's very touching. It, she saw love and she knew love as love. And um, it's obvious. And she's just somebody I would have been drawn to in any case, whether I knew she was with Baba. I just see that face. And I would, I'm sure I would have wanted to know her. So thank you for sharing. That's a beautiful video, just exquisite. Um, Rufi, and the music was so perfect with it. Thank you. Dear Baba Gabriela, thank you, dear. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to describe what that essence, what her presence was like, but she was a funny woman. She was, um, you did, she didn't vote any fools. So you had to be on your P's and Q's when you were around her. She was formidable. She was a dance teacher. She didn't want you just bringing any old thing in front of her. So um, I'm grateful that I had an opportunity. I remember coming out of Kitty's door once and, and Margaret was sitting there writing in the sun on Kitty's porch and uh, there was a chair next to her. So of course I took it. And she said, um, she was writing about, I guess she was writing, um, I want to say more dancing with love, but I'm, I'm not sure that's correct, but her second book. And um, she said to me, I don't even know how it came up, but she said to me, all you have to do is say his name to someone. That's all your job is or they can see his face. And after that, you have nothing to do with it. The connection occurs right there and it's not about you. So that always um, stuck with me after that because I, I just let go of the idea of me telling people about Mayor Baba when all I had to do was say his name or for them to see his face. And um, I took it on her authority that that was the truth. Well, all right, I have a little video. I'm not sure how much we'll share, but just a, a bit of it. And it'll give us an idea of, of um, her speaking, which I think is kind of cool. Let me see if I got it. I think this is it. Yeah. Sorry, it's just taking me a minute to find the one I was thinking of. Oh, I know. Sorry. This wasn't it at all. Let me stop sharing here. It was actually this one that the center just sent out. And it looked pretty cool to me. So let's take a look at this. Music's on. All right. Let's see what we get here. My name is Margaret. After I had been in, in India some time in thirty nine, uh, starting in thirty nine, there began to be sessions in the evening. Uh, when we sat around Baba, which we always did anyway, when I was asked to read out loud a certain detective stories, which Baba seemed to enjoy very much. We managed to get the books out to India. It was very difficult. This was during the war, but we did get them and they came. And um, Baba had loved very much Agatha Christie's writing and he, 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 her wonderful detective, an amusing detective, uh, Poirot, and he, but his favorite of all was, um, I think, Rick Stout. 
who uh, has this extraordinary uh, um, detective called Nero Wolf. Barber enjoyed these stories very much. Now, he had a habit that didn't help us very much. He'd wait till the most exciting point and then close the book and say nothing more till tomorrow. And I had charge of the books and I wasn't allowed to look in them and no one was allowed to know till the next time we had a session together at the end of the story. Um, this went on for a very long time. And <clears throat> even after I left India, I sent um, books out to India every two weeks uh, of these different writers that Baba liked very much. Now, a strange thing that uh, uh, happened. We were in Secunderabad, and it was the last week of the uh, European part of the war, not well, afterwards the um, bomb in Japan and so on, but the European part of the war. And um, we hadn't had any newspapers. Barbara kept them away from us. We knew nothing that was going on, nothing. Barbara announced he was going to have a week's fast. Nobody knew why. I mean, we didn't anyway, not the people in the ashram. And uh, um, this was uh, allowed. He said, well, Mera may share one day with me. No one else was allowed to share one day of this fast. And no one knew what was happening in the world. We just didn't know about it. So, but what happened to me was, at midday, and this was a place where the, where the temperature was, uh, heat was, uh, um, one, what's it, day and night it was about 115. But at midday, for two or three days, Baba sent for me. He was alone. One was seldom alone with Baba. There was no one there. The girls had gone for rest, and he'd say, he'd sign to read. Fetch a book and read. So I fetched a book, and I sat down, and then Baba proceeded to cover himself with a sheet. And there was I, sitting in the heat, reading aloud a detective story, all alone, faced only by a sheet. And I'm sure Baba couldn't hear a word I was reading. I would read until the room began to turn black. What with the heat and Baba under the sheet, and my not knowing what was going on, I was just prepared to faint when Baba would spring up, signal for me to go away, take the book and disappear. And he did that, I should say, at least four times during that period at the end of the war. One day I had to take the dog, Manny's um, dog, for a walk. I love this dog very much. I got outside the gate alone for a few minutes, which is a very rare thing, and what a relief it was to walk along a street. And I walk, taking this dog along, and I came to a house on the other side of the road, decorated with flags. So I went over, curious to know what had happened in this strange town, it's country bad. And it was Lieutenant Colonel's house, Lieutenant Colonel someone or the other, on the gate. So I knew that the war was over. And that was uh, a very strange period of reading to Baba, when I read to him under a sheet. Well, the reading went on. It always went on. That's the end of that. Unless you want to say anything else about it. Yeah. Yeah. Go? Mm -hmm. um, in many places when we were with Baba, touring mostly, We'd sit round him in the evening, wherever we were, so we had no chairs, we sat on the floor, and um, Baba would talk to us, and um, then he'd point to someone and say, tell a story. And this poor unfortunate person maybe never read a story in her life or something, but she'd scrape, scrape up something. And we all, at that time, we'd, uh, we, Rano had some books sent out there from America with short stories in them. We would. Uh, reading these short stories all the time, hoping we could find something to please Baba. And then one evening I was absolutely stuck for a story, and I said, I'll tell you a story I wrote when I was a little girl. So Baba put up with this, and I told him the story. And then he said, now, for the future, every night, 
you're to make up a story, and I will give you the title the night before. So every night, Baba gave me a title, title of some something, and during the day I had to make up a story to it. It was quite simple at the time because I was doing a job. Um, I was sitting at the gate, guarding the gate from anyone who wanted to come in. And so I sat there under this tree and made up these stories. And um, every night Baba gave me a title. And if the story wasn't quite up to scratch, he had a few words about it and said I hadn't put myself into it properly. So I had really to work quite hard every day. And um, uh, finally, after about a month, this was in Panchgani, we were up in the hills. At the end of a month, he said, now, every day, you have to remember all the stories you've told and you have to write them down. So I had to go outside in the garden. There was never anywhere to write in any house, no table or anything, and write all these stories down for Baba. And that's the end of that one. Um, I'll tell you a story of one of the inexplicable orders that Baba gave me. It was in London in 1934, and the Conservative Party had decided to boost itself by giving a la large performance at the Albert Hall. There were scenes from English history, small scene up on the top wall and a small scene on the lower floor and so on. And Quentin Todd and I, Quentin Todd was a, a disciple of Baba's who was a, a director in the theatre, were asked to put on the uh, two or three small scenes. And one was a scene of um, Titania and Oberon. And um, Titania <clears throat> was a very, very beautiful young girl, and she played the part beautifully. It wasn't a difficult part, but still, a small dancing part. Well, as soon as we finished this thing and got it on the way, Baba came to London in 1934. And of course, Quentin and I were delighted that Baba was there and see our work going on, see what we've done. And we asked Baba if we might get tickets and take him, and he, he uh, said yes. And I think he only allowed one of the men to come with him. He didn't let us take the whole of the party that was there at the house where we were staying. And uh, we, uh, everything went along quite well until uh, Titania and Oberon were playing their scene. And Baba suddenly nudged me and spelt on the board, I wish to shake hands with that girl, but she must not know who I am. Now, this wasn't easy because Baba's picture had been in the papers. This girl and anybody who was in the uh, work that Quentin and I were doing knew of our connection with Baba. And how are we to get this girl to shake hands with Baba and not know who he was? So Quentin and I worked out a plan, not a very kind plan, but it had to be done. We went down to the uh, dressing room with Baba and uh, waited until this girl came from the uh, stage. And as she came towards her dressing room, Quentin and I rushed at her and told her how badly she danced. What a terrible performance she'd given, and that if she couldn't do better than that, we would see that we never gave her another job, never. And the poor, poor girl burst into tears, naturally, because she hadn't danced badly at all. And uh, we got her well crying, good and strong, weeping. And then we said, oh, by the way, this is a friend of ours, Mewan Irani. And she put her hands and said, how do you do? <laughs> And so Baba turned away. He was perfectly satisfied. The girl was not. So we had to go around the next night and soothe her down, tell her how beautifully she danced, and that we were sure she was sick the night before, and we hadn't meant what we said. But that was one of Baba's strange orders, and I, I have no idea why this, he had to shake hands with that girl.
Just wonder if anybody has anything they'd like to share about Miss Crass. Yes, Karen. Um, I think most of what I've learned about her really has come from the dancers, from Jeannie um, McDonald, who was one of her pupils, um, who spoke so lovingly about her. And, and witty is certainly a word that would describe her. I know that when she was in Happy House at Myrtle Beach, that we went and sat <clears throat> sat there and she did tell stories. Um, and I remember Kitty, we once had dinner, a lunch, I think it must've been lunch um, downtown. Well, it was about 33rd Street at a restaurant, a fish restaurant. And she showed us that where Margaret would stay when she would come down for vacations. Um, so she was the most remarkable and most beautiful woman. Um, and certainly the people who were close to her and knew her, the dancers, had an amazing karma, karmic um, reaction, were karmically involved with her very heavily. Um, Brenner Mel was someone that comes to mind who met Baba. I mean, they met Baba because of her. Um, so her, her role, like for Chanchi to say, Baba must have her, she is clearly his link, is pretty remarkable. So we were all fortunate to be in her presence and hear not only her stories from her, um, but from others, from others who knew her quite intimately and quite well. Jay Baba, that's all. Jay Baba. Yeah, I was thinking of a story or two as well. Um, yeah, they just kind of fell through my brain here. Of Margaret. I remember um, once I was in the um, area in front of Kitty's house and Kitty was sitting they were older then. Kitty was sitting in a, in a little garden chair over here. And then at the far end was Margaret. And um, my new husband at the time, Stephen, uh, we were standing there by Kitty and everybody was like bees around Kitty. And my husband indicated Margaret. And he happened to be standing right next to Kitty. And he said, oh, Ruth, I think I'm going to go over and speak to Margaret. And Kitty grabbed his arm and said, no, 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 stay here with me. <laughs> so we did. Oh, gosh. Just so many, um, so many beautiful things about her, about Margaret Crask. I was there uh, when she passed away. I just, I don't know why there I was in February at the center. It wasn't my usual time to go, but... I happened to be there and um, one of the dancers, I think I arrived, it was a rainy night and for some reason I went to the original kitchen and at the kitchen was the dancer of Margaret's bringing flowers into the original kitchen and putting them in vases to take into the lagoon cabin. And they were flowers from Margaret's room. And Margaret had just passed and she asked me if I'd like to carry some flowers in with her. And I said, uh, yes, of course, I'd love to. So we carried flowers into the lagoon cabin. And when we walked in, this dancer said, oh, Baba, you've taken your lady. And we put the flowers down. And um, so I was grateful to be there at the time that Margaret passed. It's wonderful just to hear her tell her stories. <laughs> well, I'm looking to see if anybody else is putting up a hand. 
Ralph. If you, I don't know if you're available, but if you are, would certainly love to hear anything you might have to remember about Kitty, about uh, Margaret, rather. Okay. Well, I can show a little more of the video, and um, and then we'll see if anybody else has anything they'd like to share. Um, in 1932, we were staying with Baba at a small hotel uh, near Portofino. Uh, in, it was in Santa Margarita, really. And um, after a bit, the whole hotel got filled up with people who were visiting Baba. And um, it was we had a lovely time there with Baba, walking over the hills, and uh, Baba was uh, very, very full of light and life, and we walked over these lovely hills, and Baba was with us all the time. Now, this, what I'm going to tell you is about Baba and an amusing dancing lesson he had. He, um, everyone, most of the other disciples had gone out to the, have their passports put right or something. I really don't know what was wrong with them because my passport was all right and Delia was all right, was all right. But the others all had to go and have something done. So Delia and I were in the garden of this hotel alone and suddenly Baba appeared. He looked very beautiful as usual but full of, uh, a little full of mischief and uh, love, lots of love but there was still a touch of mischief there. And he came up and he said um, to us, well, what should we do? And as I've already told you, he had told us that he'd come to meet us on our level, so I had what I thought was a joke. And I said, uh, well, let's leave the universe and have some fun, Baba. Let leave the universe for the afternoon. So Baba nodded his head and looked delighted at the idea of leaving the universe. And, um, and first of all, he jumped on my back. That was the first piece of leaving the universe and nearly broke my back. But um, uh, he then said um, that he would like to have a dancing lesson. So Chanji took his hand and brought him to class and um, asked a few of the usual questions one asks a new pupil. And then I took his hand and <clears throat> I did one, two, three, hop, almost like a polka step in front, going forward. And he joined in immediately. There was no having to learn it. And we danced all around the garden, and it was like flying. Baba was his hair flying and his white robe fl flying, and we both did one, two, three, hop, all around this garden, right round to we... And it was quite a long way, but I've never felt such lovely dancing in my life. I mean, it really was inspiring to move with Baba like that. And um, then I think I, sh I showed him something else, but it wasn't quite such a, an excitement and as, as such a beauty as the first step. And uh, that, was a, that was Baba's dancing lesson. Um, I just remembered... Um, I went to see Margaret on Kitty's porch in the back, on the screen porch, and I had a friend from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was from, and I don't know if she noticed it first or I did, but Margaret wore this beautiful scarab ring, and one of us called attention to her ring and said, oh, Margaret, that's just a beautiful ring. And she said, oh, yes, she was so careful with it because she was afraid that it would slip off her finger um, and um, that her Baba had given her the ring. And she said that um, in the early days, the girls would all vie for Baba's uh, attention. And they would do it by saying things like, oh, Baba, when you were Rama, I was Sita, right? Or when you were this one, I was that one. Always these connections of, of this important other woman. And so Margaret said, 
oh, Baba, we'll be engaged and you'll never have to marry me. And so the next day, Baba came and brought this beautiful scarab ring and put it on her finger. So years later, I told the story to, I guess then it was my, my um, husband at the time. And we went over to Happy House and this is my new husband, Stephen, Margaret, I'd like you to meet Stephen Whitlock. And um, I told him that story about your engagement ring with Baba. And she said, oh, no, no, you weren't supposed to tell anyone that story. That was a secret. <laughs> and of course, a secret, the cat was out of the bag. And it turned out that she actually put it in her book, I believe. So I wasn't that far off the mark. <laughs> Telling her secrets. Yes, Karen, J. Baba. Thank you for sharing that because I do have that written down. And I think one extra little note that I have is that it, it, that she was very respectful of Mara. So that even though she had this engagement ring, I think she wanted to make certain and let those know that at that time she was very respectful of Mara. Is it over? Yeah, or? you can put your own. Alan has yeah, a story. Sense. Yeah, yeah, Alan. So I'm going to let him sit Thanks, down. Karen. That makes perfect sense. Alan. Jay yes. Jay Baba, Jay Baba. So how many people am I speaking to here? Well, uh, a number of people, but my face. All right. Well, in any event, this story is not in a book. So it was probably 37 and probably at Nasik. And uh, during the day, Baba gave the... Um, people westerners time to like wash their clothes that kind of thing in the afternoon so it, it so happened that margaret was washing her clothes and a jaw of his brother came very heartily and said margaret baba wants to see you immediately uh so let's go and um then he left but uh that was private time and she always felt that jaw would tell jokes so she continued washing her clothes. Um, after some time, Baba noticed that Margaret had not come and he was getting quite angry. So he, he said to Pendu, I believe, go find Margaret and tell her to come. So Pendu came very hurriedly to Margaret and said, Margaret, why have you not come? Baba called you. And she realized <laughs> that she had actually been asked to come. So she obviously dropped whatever she was doing and ran to Baba, who was quite angry at this point, And she was, you know, harried and humiliated. And she said, uh, he said to, to her, Margaret, I sent my brother Jal to tell you to come. The one I had to tell you something and you didn't come. He said, well, Baba, your brother always is telling jokes and I thought he was joking with me because that's our private time. And Baba got quite serious and he looked at her and he said, Margaret, it is true that my brother Jal does tell jokes. But when it comes to me, he never jokes. And Margaret learned a very sober lesson that day about Jal. So that's a story not in the books. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Jay I'm looking Baba. at myself here, which is, not, which is not the best thing to look at. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. I got nothing. That's good. good All right. I don't, know where, I don't know where Karen Talbot went, but... Um, She's in the house. I know. She'll be giving orders in no time at all. Well, in the block, you're identified as Karen, so... I understand. And in my life, I identify <laughs> appropriately. <laughs> so Ralph Jackson's there. It's good to hear Ralph Jackson. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to... Just another up. cute chick. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get better than Ralph Jackson. 
So Ralph, what's your experience? Did you meet Margaret? Yeah, a few times. I mean, quite a bit, actually. Yeah. But I think I got, um, you know, eye exercises <laughs> that we often encounter and just and do eye exercises and nothing that more just kind of what I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing too outstanding. No, no wedding, no rings, nothing like that. No howling. You didn't howl with her. One time I did ask her about her sweetheart that she said Baba had killed off. I asked her about that. And and I don't remember. And she did share a few things about the relationship and like that, but I don't it what I don't remember it I, I've lost the story. Then there wasn't much to it either. Uh and she didn't tell me a whole lot. Well, that was cool that you thought to ask. She seemed a little amused that I asked. Yeah. Uh well, I always like the story about, uh, I think it was Kathy uh, Riley talking about how they would howl. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret howling at the moon at night. Yeah. There was no one like Margaret Kresk. Well, if we have no other um, offerings right now, then I think we'll have a moment of silence. Karen, unless you have anything else? No? All right, let's take a moment and remember the beloved who brought us here today. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, if you'd like to unmute. Avatar Meher Baba, Ki Jay. Jay Baba. <laughs> <laughs> 